Welcome back to another Engineers podcast. Uh, it's your host, Elliot Kipling. Today, uh, I've got Matteo today joining us from uh, Box, company Box. He's the Senior Director of Engineering, and he's going to be talking to us about a couple of subjects today centered around security concepts that they've deployed in regards to a pretty complex product that they've got. It's cross-collaboration or really secure cross-collaboration uh, across any device, which I think is pretty cool. We've done some similar topics in the past before, but I'm really keen to explore a little bit more about the product, what you guys are doing, what you're building, but also placing an emphasis on your culture and how you've built that specifically in one of your offices and how you've grown the team, which has been, I think, a really positive time over the last, you know, 12, 18 months with everything that's been going on in the industry. So, Matteo, thanks for coming to join us. For, for everyone listening, do you want to give us an intro into you, but also your elevator pitch into who Box are? Yes. No, thanks, Elio. Thanks for having me. It's great for being here. So my name is Matteo, as, as Elliot said. Yeah, I'm Senior Director of Engineering and Site Lead for the Amsterdam site for Box. Uh, briefly about myself, I am Italian, coming from a small town in central Italy. I grew up there. I did my studies there in applied mathematics and computer science. I started working as a software engineer you know, a while ago, <laughs> let's put it like that. Uh, then from software engineering, I transitioned to uh, you know, test engineering, test management. Then I grew up on management and leadership roles. And eventually now, you know, since last November, I joined uh, Box.com in the, in the current role. Um, what is Box? Uh, Box is a content cloud provider. Uh, we are focusing mostly on B2B. And uh, the focus that we have is big clients, but even small, medium business. Our goal is to have end-to-end -end content management through Box. So we try to really leverage two aspects. One is the security of our platform. And the other one is the integration with other tools, application, and so on. So that you can use Box to manage your content without necessarily dismissing other tools that you are excited or familiar with and so on. So we allow customers to integrate existing tools with us so that we can do the management, uh, you know, uh, through Box uh, about their whole content. Um, I'm emphasizing on the security because this has been one of our uh, highest, uh, highest value and highest focus in the past years. So Box is the most secure uh, content cloud uh, platform on the market, I guess, or if not the most among the top five for some, say for sure. Okay. Well, what's that journey been like to get to top 5%? Because every conversation I'm having at the moment with engineering leaders in the industry is centered around influencing security, influencing understanding of cybersecurity risks. So what's that journey been like? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, then, of course, I, I can talk based on what I know about the company before joining and after joining. I think it has been a really strategic focus for us, like how we could differentiate ourselves in a segment so that we can deliver value to our customers independently of what is their business. So, you know, trying to really make sure that it doesn't matter if you are in a banking industry or if you are in, I don't know, say e-commerce or uh, whatever is the segment that you have, pharmaceutics and so on, trying to have a baseline that we can apply across different domains that is giving confidence that if you use our platform, the platform is giving you really, you know, the possibility to sleep well. Let's put it like that. <laughs> what, what do you think have been some of those baseline concepts that you've applied to the product? that ensure this top 5% stature? Yes. So for us, we started focusing on, on one side, obviously, cloud security. So with the movement, let's say, which is a pretty, pretty good trend on the market at the moment, from uh, uh, physical data storage to, to cloud, uh, we wanted to make sure that by doing that transition, our security 
best practices were there. So really trying to look at, you know, how can we make sure that we don't get flows there? Then the security of the network. This is uh, another piece uh, like uh, how your company network connect uh, all the devices in the business with each other and so on. How can we make sure that Box uh, is uh, giving you the education to do well there, but at the same time, an internal infrastructure that is preventing potential flows there. Um, the information security, uh, you know, keeping both hard copies of information and virtual data protected, uh, which is, uh, you know, one of the main reasons we'll say why we were analyzing multiple partners and, you know, who can allow us, for instance, to have two hard copies of a document and uh, how much is going to cost us. This is something that we look at. Um, application security, so, you know, just uh, classic things to prevent attacks uh, like uh, cross-site forgery or, uh, you know, uh, SQL injections. Those are very basic things. And then we started looking at things, of course, like dis disaster recovery and ransomware as well. Uh, disaster recovery is like, uh, what if there is a production outage and the world is down and what, what do you do to make sure that you don't lose access to the documentation that you have and especially if you don't lose access to the history of those documentation and the ransomware is like uh, a topic that is getting more trendy in the last uh, last year year and a half which is on the similar note like what if tomorrow we are under an attack all our systems are down are we able to provide basic support to our customers so that they can do you know, operation, at least having access to the data. And last but not least, which is an area that we started looking at more recently, is uh, artificial intelligence. Like how the security domain is going to be, you know, evolving with the AI. So with all these tools that are allowing you to build codes and so on, we see, and not only us, really the industry, see a potential threat there. So we want to understand how we, we can play around with AI to understand potential flows and making sure that we keep ourselves up to date. When you say play around with AI to understand potential flows, would you be able to just go a layer deeper and help me, help the audience understand a little bit more about what that actually might mean? So, yeah, one example is like we have seen how the AI can help you to generate code, for instance. Uh, can the AI generate code that is able to hack a website? For instance, you know, it's very likely it's the next step. But who is telling us that we will not get there? That's one thing. Or another example is like we have seen, uh, uh, at least I did, multiple videos, especially on LinkedIn, uh, one that really impressed me was like a video with Morgan Freeman face and Morgan Freeman voice when on the background was a different person. So how can we prevent that, you know, an AI tool is basically calling a customer saying with Matteo voice or with Matteo face, hey, I am Matteo, I have those data that I was able to retrieve through social media or whatever you have, give me access to this. Uh, you know, th those are threats that we are looking at that are uh, very interesting because it's a domain that is very new for the industry as well. And, uh, you know, if you, if you talk to engineers, it's like, hey, there is a nice challenge for you. A lot of them get excited. It's like, oh, I want to go, go deeper on that. I want to play with the tool. I want to understand what's going on. So and this can help us to get data. Yeah, well, I, I think a number of things that are really interesting that you've been focusing on were around building your core internal infrastructure and applying concepts to ensure that you're protected, you're protecting your customers. But I think the example that you've just given is really about the user or the end user maybe interpreting something very different actually to um, what should happen, I think, in normal circumstances. And that's that's the evolution of AI and how it'll impact security. I think it's scary for the industry. And I think it's a problem that will be hard to solve. Or from where I'm sitting, that's how I understand it. It's a real challenge, you know. Like, uh, the other point is that today we have a lot of unknowns. Uh, so yeah. if, if 
we didn't play a lot with AI. There are many things that we don't know. Okay? And even if you played with that, in the last year and a half, there has been such a speed of an evolution that has been so exponential. So that maybe, you know, something that you have seen two years ago you were very familiar with, today is totally different. So, you know, th th those are things that we want to look at uh, because on one side, as I told you, are very exciting because we feel that we are part of a, you know, technical revolution. Uh, we feel that we are facing something similar to the smartphone. Like, you know, I remember before 2007-ish, uh, we were having those phones that you can take pictures and so on. Then the first uh, iPhone came and was a revolutionary thing. We have the feeling that with AI, we are in a similar, you know, kind of uh, scenario, something that is totally new that can make a big revolution. So the unknown are scary. At the same time, they're exciting because it's like, we need, we need to get deeper there. Yeah. What other security risks or challenges do you think there are in today's industry yeah i mean the the cross-site forgery is quite a common one uh, even the sql injection those are very classic um, it is uh, always amazing once we do penetration test to see that despite we are doing we as companies in general not only box no really efforts to upgrade our security we managed to get penetrated at times. So, you know, and then uh, we need to understand why. We need to understand what didn't go well. So there are different techniques uh, that can allow anybody potentially to get access to your, let's say, internal websites, internal information. The point is like, how many information are you able to get as a hacker? That's what is making the difference. Like, uh, what I've seen is like it's possible for people to get inside the, the, the system of a company, but then what is preventing uh, this hacker to get the data is really what is, you know, the asset that the company is giving. Um, I'm not aware of breaches in box so far, which is a very good thing. And I'm talking more from a generic perspective than from a, from a box purity perspective. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what I've seen in those years, basically. Yeah, well, one CTO that I've been speaking to really recently, you know, exactly like I said at the start of the podcast, did say that cybersecurity risks are becoming so prevalent that uh, not necessarily it's challenging to convince C level, board level members or advisors on this stuff but educating them on how important it really is and what are our risks it can become quite challenging because you need to influence people that it's a today problem that it can happen at any time and no doubt as an engineering leader that's probably something that you have to deal with on a day to day what's that experience like yeah, I mean, it's, as you say, the educational piece is very important. And uh, usually an area that I touch when doing the educational part is thinking about potential loss coming from lawsuits. Like uh, if someone, so if you say that your company, let's say, is super secure, someone is getting your financial and personal data, let's say, because you are not that secure, then they exploit that data to, you know, their advantage. In the B2B sector, we are talking about probably, you know, billion dollar companies, even maybe. So the, the risk of, of a lawsuit is, uh, is quite high. So when you start talking to uh, C-level, let's say on those numbers, then there is a, a more, uh, let's say, tendency to listen, which is uh, like, oh, we talk about numbers, we talk about loss. Money loss, okay. So that's a, that's that's very important. So getting the the leaders listening and understanding where the problem is is helping as well to make investment uh, with the teams. You know, to say, hey, like, we don't want to get that loss, so we need to get better. Um, a similar domain, different, of course, 
but very important for us and this inbox is uh, for instance the the digital signature business which is uh, the product that we are developing here in Amsterdam so the the digital signature is something that is having very high legal implications so you know you, we need to be top notch when it comes to logs uh, ip address uh, uh, all the information about the digital signature so that if there is a potential lawsuit uh, you know the company is showing that we have been secure we have been clean in our uh, you know technological aspect and we can even support justice to make the right decision um, something that uh, good timing actually this morning we got uh, in the in the Dutch newspaper, a case of someone that tried to make, uh, then the whole thing was in Dutch, so I didn't get it really well, but was trying to exploit some potential flow uh, in the tools, in our tool, but thanks to our logs, uh, the Department of Justice was able to understand really what happened. And we were able to help to, you know, basically in the in the resolution of the case. So you know, that was that was very very interesting. Like uh, you know, so came in the office today. People tell me, "Oh, we made the news." Like, oh, okay. okay. Uh, I was going to say, to be clear, uh, one of Box's products. Yes. So in this case, is signrequest.com, which is part of Box. But, uh, I will give you a little bit of history about the Amsterdam site, which is uh, even one of the topic here. So um, historically, Amsterdam site was a, a Dutch startup signrequest.com okay signrequest.com is a company that was bought by box in uh, if i'm not wrong probably 2020 or 2021 in the vision of the company box to do this 360 content management within box the point is if you don't have the possibility to do digital signature you cannot do 360 content management because at some point in your lifespan you will need to ask someone to sign those documents. So if you don't have this, you cannot have the end-to-end -end content management. No? So it was a strategic acquisition. Uh, it's a very good, was a very good company, still a very good company. I think it was around 15 engineers at the time, probably a little bit less. And that's the, where we were at in Amsterdam, I would say, toward the end of 2020, 2022 at the time. This was the amount of employees that we had. Then, of course, being bought by Box, part of this became Box Sign, but we still kept the signrequest.com business outrunning for existing customers. Okay? So this case is about signrequest.com, which is a Box company, which is the company that we have acquired. Uh, the Amsterdam site since then transformed from signrequest.com site to Box. So now we have multiple products, not only sign. And we grew from, uh, let's say, 15, 16 people to 58 uh, today. Uh, I would say at least 52 of them being uh, what we call build, which is uh, software engineering and product management. So it's, a, it's an engineering site that is growing. It has been growing very fast in the last year, and now we decided to slow down a little bit the hiring. It's not frozen. So we have positions there, but we decided to be more conscious given the time that we had recently in the industry, I would say. Well, okay. So a strategic acquisition that I think makes complete sense to keep everything 360 online, facilitate a process, great. What do you think that journey's been like? you know, maintaining the core values of the business, maintaining or growing the culture, because I didn't know some of that backdrop, so it's fascinating to know that. But help me understand a little bit about the, the culture, the leadership, the values, and what that actually looks like today. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing question, because uh, I think in Amsterdam, we had a specific challenge compared to other side that we have. Uh, I'm not saying that it's more difficult or more easy. It was just different. I take our site in Poland as a comparison. So three years ago, the company decided to start a, a, an engineering center in Warsaw, uh, hired at the time, you know, my equivalent, uh, like senior director of engineering and site lead 
four words and started from scratch, which is very difficult. Today, we have more than 200 engineers involved. Uh, basically, in that case, you start the culture from scratch and you need to understand how you want to grow the site and so on, which is a, a very difficult challenge. What we had in Amsterdam in terms of different challenge was that we had to combine three things. One is signrequest.com culture, which is not necessarily box culture, okay? It's not better or worse, it's just different, okay? That's one thing. The other thing is box culture, because we had some employee from box that came here, okay? And the other thing is the culture from the new hire of the, from the industry. Like when you go hyper growth, that in one year you hire like 50 people, you basically hire like uh, four people per month, probably, okay? So, and all those are coming from different background, not only from a national perspective, but even from a work perspective. So how do you make sure that the previous culture from sign request, what you get from the new hires is gradually colliding and matching with the box culture? That's the challenge that we, that we had. That's why I was hired as well, <laughs> so you know, to to make sure that, that we were doing a good job there. Uh, and for me, the very first point was to understand the company values. So really live and breathe the values that the company has, and understand how to replicate here as quickly as possible the culture that we have in our Redwood City headquarter in Silicon Valley. And at the same time, the, the technical office uh, that we have in, uh, in, uh, in Warsaw as well. Because by the time I joined, I've seen that they manage in Warsaw to replicate well the same type of culture that we had in Redwood City. So I was like, we need to make sure that we are aligning ourselves with Redwood City and with Warsaw. Because, you know, when you go in a box office, you want to leave the box experience, you know. Uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much how it is. I'll tip my hat to you. Uh, an acquisition, multi-location, hypergrowth. That's quite complex when it comes to like realigning people, you know, from two different companies, by the way, and getting them moving in the right direction when there's changes from both sides, plus adding more people to that change. That's a pretty tough job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but that's why that's why I took it. I like that. <laughs> Good. I like the challenge, you know, that's, uh, I felt that there was uh, a lot of excitement coming from the people I spoke with. Like, uh, I, I have interacted uh, in the last, uh, I would say, nine months, including the, the recruitment process, because it's like uh, seven months I'm in the company and so on, with multiple leaders that we have, our CPO, our CTO, the CEO as well, uh, our head of engineering. Uh, VP of engineering, uh, you know, VP of product, my counterpart in Poland, and so on. Then same people department, chief of staff, and so on. What I noticed from all these people were two things. One, the passion that they had about the company and about the product itself, and the commitment that they had to make Amsterdam successful. So, like, they knew that we had a lot of work to do, but there was commitment. It was like, this is something that we take seriously. And, you know, and I saw it, of course, uh, with words during the, the recruitment process, but then I saw it with facts as well when I joined the company. And that was uh, something that gave me confidence uh, to join, gave me excitement as well. I knew that there was a lot to do, but I was like, okay, it's a, it's a challenge that I will enjoy. So, yeah. So I'm happy. <laughs> Good. No, I think that's important. You know, we, we've we spoken offline and I know CELA level have done some great things to ensure that, you know, layoffs, you know, don't take place throughout the business. Obviously, I'm not privy to some of that information, but it seems as if you've got a leadership team that's really, really invested in, you know, the, the business, the welfare of the people, you know. It, I think embodying those company values is extremely, extremely important and people to be able to feel that as well. Um, so 
good that that it carries you know top down as well yeah that's exactly part of our core values like leading by example is something that we want to have with within ourselves so us uh, as the leader of the company we need to show the example no so and we need to take steps to make sure that people understand that we lead by example and this is at the same time allowing us to have a very good uh, uh, talent retention so our attrition is very low uh, we have been scoring really high in glassdoor and uh, best place to work uh, um, you know surveys and so on so all this all this website that are telling to the market how well companies are doing we historic, historically scored high uh, because of the leadership our c level the world suit is leading by example we do it as well and then it's coming from management and then people uh, so this is one thing so the ownership it's important yeah that's really important how would you describe the engineering culture in yeah. in the amsterdam office 52 out of 58 people are yeah. billed that's you know that's enormous how would you describe the engineering culture yeah that's a that, that's a good point like uh, on one side we want to keep the company culture so you know similar engineering but not only engineering like one thing that we are really keen on is like being engaged in in social activities like volunteering uh, you know uh, anything that can help let's say we, to give an example in december we were cleaning the canal of amsterdam because we we want to be engaged uh, with the environment um, like in a couple of weeks we are going to join the night of the refugee which is a, 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 a walk that we are doing in Amsterdam to support a non-profit organization that are helping refugees. So all those type of things. The company is really keen to have people that are not only good engineers in this case or good employees, but are really keen to really help the community. We have what we call like uh, uh, specific groups inside the company, one for women in tech, one to develop uh, young professionals, uh, one for families, one about, uh, uh, we call it box green tech, about, you know, being sustainable. Um, another one about Latinos in tech. Uh, so we have multiple of these. The Pride organization that, you know, uh, with the Pride Month and the, the, the Pride event that is coming to Amsterdam very soon. We want to have this, we have these groups and we want to have representatives to organize events, to raise awareness about those topics. That's one thing. And that is regardless of your role of engineering, marketing, sales, or whatever. Okay, on the engineering specifically, we emphasize on two things, which is ownership and empowerment. Okay, we want to have people that feel comfortable to make decisions, and if the decision is a wrong decision, we will know, we will learn, we will correct. And we will do our best to make sure the next time doesn't happen. But if you never make a decision, you will never know if this is a good or bad decision, so you will never learn. So we want people really going outside of their comfort zone. And the other thing is the ownership. Like you build code, you own this code. If there are problems with this part of the code, you need to be the first one to jump on a call to make sure that, you know, we resolve the problem, and the next time you start sharing knowledge, and next time you, we don't do the same mistake. So we want to avoid like uh, this, uh, you know, shared responsibilities, no responsibilities, uh, let's say pitfall. But we want to make sure that people have accountability as if it is their own company. So we have it as a written company value. You know, this this is your company basically. Show it at the end of the day, and at the same time feel free to take decisions feel free to make mistakes you know learn from that and grow from that okay i think that's quite a powerful message i think when i ask people about an engineering culture you know naturally people deviate to you know hackathons or town halls or maybe people doing presentations sponsoring events blogging but i think it's interesting you touch on something that is centered around building relationships with peers, building relationships with communities that is 
pretty central to be able to create a culture anyway. An engineering culture just isn't about, you know, sitting down and creating something together in a team of four, a team of six, but actually building relationships with peers it is fundamental to that anyway. So I think it's really great to see where some of the values come from and actually how much you're contributing to the local community, but placing an emphasis on your people actually working together, engineering or non-engineering. Definitely. Like that doesn't mean that we don't do the other events. Like next week, Course. we have the hackathon. Like uh, last week, we had uh, one of our senior engineers speaking to a conference, Python conference in Groningen, the day after doing mentorship for the Django Girls group. Uh, two weeks before, we had one of our staff engineers joining the React uh, Amsterdam meetup, giving a talk there. So we are engaged on that. But the point, as you say, it's like what, what we really value the most is uh, this interaction between each other and the message that, you know, this is your company. You need to feel that. You need to feel comfortable to make decisions and really, you know, uh, learn from mistakes that you make because nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. As much as we learn from that, there is no problem. So, you know, like, uh, but if you never try, you never go outside of your comfort zone, growth is slow. So that's something that, you know, we want to, we want to mitigate as much as possible. What challenges do you see going from on-prem to a cloud service? Yeah, the first thing is the knowledge. Like uh, how many people are familiar with, uh, with cloud uh, in, uh, in such a deep way that you can prevent common pitfall, pitfalls? This is a big question, Mark. You, know? you can have so many good engineers. We have uh, especially a couple of people here in Amsterdam that are leading this effort for uh, for us, they're, they're amazing. They have so much knowledge. And every time there's like some unknown that you're like, oh, who didn't think about that? It's like, okay, we need to adjust, correct, and so on. And this is uh, something that we see at company level, you know? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it is what it is. We had similar challenges in, in other companies too when I was working in previous company with the migration to AWS. Uh, was a similar hiccup, like uh, tool working great. Eventually, when we understood how to use it, uh, top notch, but it took us a good year, year and a half, in some instances, even two years. And how do you do that? No? We, we've spoken about the education piece quite a lot, and it feels the same way with, you know, introducing a cloud service where we're moving some of our services from on-prem to a cloud provider. What, what does that upskilling education piece really look like internally and how do you foster that how do you push that on because if let's say eight out of ten people don't know how to do something you can you can hit stumbling blocks quite quick it can slow you down yeah I have a great question Elliot for us uh, the 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 approach that we have taken was one Starting having people doing certifications is not mandatory, but is very highly recommended. The fact that this is a domain that is pretty new is getting engineers excited. So it's not something that you have to push. So like, hey, folks, we have a certification for you. We made sure that we want people to allocate time for personal development during working hours. So, you know, if you want to do it outside of your of working hours, it's your choice. But I want people having at least a couple of hours per week for personal development if they want. So this is sending a message. Hey, we want you to learn things. We want you to spend time during your working hours to learn. The other thing is having a strong relationship with the provider. Can we have sessions and deep dives with engineers so that we can learn from them? how to use the product. And this is something that has been very powerful. Uh, and we took similar approach in other companies as well with different tools. Some of them with coming from Google. I remember when I was using uh, API G as uh, you know API, API gateway provider from Google, we were doing deep dives with uh, Google engineers to understand how to use the tool. And then keeping asking questions to those engineers as well once you're stuck. 
capturing the knowledge somewhere and make sure that you are kind of mentoring the people sitting close to you at the end of the day. Yeah, I think definitely the second point. Um, I think both cloud providers that we've spoken about today, AWS and GCP, they've got phenomenal teams that, you know, act as architects, consultants, and they really help you explore why to use their cloud service, but how to, I guess, you know, harness some of the power that you can with GCP or AWS. So leveraging that, I can imagine, is really powerful. Before we wrap up, we, we typically circle round to business growth. Obviously, we've done 40 minutes on what seems like an unbelievable company from, you know, top down as in sea level really practicing and embodying some of the company values you know the acquisition is pretty exciting it's made your role exciting but you know i love the the product offering and some of the real challenges that you know you you get into what does the next 6 to 12 months look like for the business for business growth potentially which you know may not be there at the moment just because of where we are in the world and everyone's being cautious you know it's, it's june 2023 so naturally uh, there's some hesitation with everything that's going on but just give us a bit of insight into what what six to 12 months might look like yeah so the first thing for us is to do our best to keep the workforce that we have so you know we we have been committed so far to not make any layoff the company didn't do any historically. We are uh, very proud about that. And we will do our best to prevent this. So if this means to make adjustment uh, at the sea level, we will keep doing so. Uh, so preserving the talent that we have inside the company is one thing. Okay? The other thing is to keep hiring. So as I was telling you, we decided to slow down the hiring pace, but we didn't stop it. To give you an example, when I joined, in December at that point, I had five openings approved for the Amsterdam site. But at that time, we decided to park them and we decided to open one by one openings based on needs. So it's like instead of hiring for five engineers, let's hire for one. Then let's see if we still have a need, assess, let's hire for another one. Then let's, let's see how it's going. So being a little bit conservative, but keep hiring. Like today, for instance, we have one opening for senior front-end engineer, one opening for uh, uh, suite two software engineer two backend. We have one, op one opening for uh, application security engineer. And uh, next week, we are going to open a position for uh, senior engineer mentor. So that's, uh, that's one thing. And uh, the last thing is about business growth. And uh, I can tell you more specifically about Amsterdam. Because, you know, sign is so strategic for us. The focus for the next six, nine months for box signs will be around uh, three things. One, customer adoption. So customer adoption is going to be important. So develop features that are allowing us to see how we can uh, get more customers. The other one, uh, the reliability, which is an area that, uh, you know, it's always good to keep investing on. And the last one, which is the quality. We want to make sure that we are, you know, in a good quality shape so that when our customers are using our product, they are happy about what they see. So keeping those three things, you know, as a top prior in our mind is, uh, is leading us toward, uh, you know, what we define success, being the reliability and the quality is something that we want to have it as hygiene thing in the mindset of engineers like part of the so-called definition of done yeah if we don't have this eventually we will see degradation and we don't want to see that. yeah and i think the reliability and the quality part has obviously got you to be where you are in the industry for being one of the most securest products and obviously applying some of what you're doing in the security space i can see why as well but i really like the conservative approach to hiring and i think it flips everything on its head with where the industry's been in the last three years with covid and there are obviously lots of challenges for 12 months but where everyone just went absolutely crazy 
But I think that conservative one by one approach is something that I honestly think we'll see in the industry quite a lot more um, when we're filling needs instead of opening up whole teams, divisions where may not be needed and businesses might think about how they can run leaner. Yeah, definitely. Matteo, honestly, it's been awesome to listen to you guys, even the acquisition, driving the culture to building a really, really solid product. It's been great to learn a little bit more about that. It's been great to have you on here. And no doubt at some point when we're in Amsterdam, I'll be grabbing you for a beer. For everyone listening, like, share, subscribe, share with your friends, share with colleagues and show them some of the cool stuff that Box are doing and help drive this forward. Because you've seen they've got some absolutely awesome things that they do culturally that focus on relationship building community first with seemingly great leadership who who do really embody some of the values that you know they talk about Matteo thanks so much for joining us thanks Elliot my pleasure anytime you know <laughs> looking forward to meet you here in Amsterdam <laughs> exactly for that beer and from us at engineers and architects it's bye for now and we'll see you soon thanks bye bye Hey guys thanks for watching this episode uh, massively appreciate you listening and checking in with us if you want to find out more about us and what we're doing please check us out on social media what we're trying to do at engineers is build a community to drive knowledge sharing and experiences on twitter we can be found at engineers io it's no underscore we've also got a website which is engineers.io these links will all be posted in the description. Any feedback and comments are massively appreciated. We're always looking to improve on where we can. Thanks, guys.